Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the September 3rd uh, Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association first Friday meeting. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us. We have um, people, guests on Facebook that have joined us, and, um, and we also have our regular members on Zoom. So we appreciate your being here. We will ask that um, people with sound, people who are on, on uh, Zoom, if you will please stay muted during our speaker presentation and the questions that will be great um, we will have uh, questions and answers and if you will type your questions into the chat um, then we will make sure those get addressed and facebook if you type yours in uh, we will make sure that those you know get answered in turn as well I'm Mae Smith, I'm the TAAA president, and, um, and working with me tonight is Terry Lappin, who will be handling um, both our uh, technology and our regular technology for the meeting and our Facebook. So Terry's going to be quite busy tonight, and um, because Jim Knoll, our other person who um, helps with this at our member meetings, is volunteering at Joshua Tree um, Park uh, this weekend and helping with their star event there. So, um, so Jim is participating at a star party and couldn't be with us tonight. Um, I, uh, I will um, let you know too that um, after the meeting, we will um, we will say goodbye to our friends from Facebook. But our member meeting will continue, and we will have some breakout rooms for um, for our members. So I'd like to introduce our speaker. Um, we have with us, we're really pleased to have with us tonight, uh, Dr. Amy Miser, um, who is from the U of A, and uh, she's been doing some significant research for quite a while. And she is going to talk about the NEO project and, and about um, various aspects of that research. So Amy, are you available to screen share right now? Yes, let me give it a shot right here and let's get going. Okay. Uh, here we go. Okay, can you see that? And I'm gonna go into presenter mode yes. here. And there we go. How is that? Wonderful, thank you. Excellent, okay, terrific. Well, thank you so much, May, for the introduction and uh, thanks everybody for having me here tonight. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. So uh, I'll talk a little bit tonight about uh, near-Earth asteroids, just some of the recent research uh, that's been going on to date and kind of put it in the broader context of, of what we know there, as well as talk about my own personal research and uh, where we would hope that things will go in the, in the near future. So uh, just in a nod to uh, an oldie but a goodie, my favorite video game from, uh, from a while back, Asteroids. Uh, the font and the, uh, the video game there. Uh, the, part of the reason I put that up is, of course, there's the nostalgia factor. I, I spent many a happy hour uh, playing this game as a kid, but I, I can also say that it's actually, now in retrospect, uh, a pretty good game. And it's, it's got certain aspects of it that really do capture what real asteroids are like. Even though it's 8-bit uh, graphics, uh, it's actually not a, bad, not a bad representation. The game starts off with one large body in the middle of the, of the playing field, and then you uh, blast it with your spaceship and it breaks into a shower of fragments. Those fragments can then in turn collide with other pieces, creating even more showers of small fragments. And believe it or not, this is, uh, this is actually what happens in the real asteroid belt in our solar system. Uh, we think it started off with a bunch of larger parent bodies and then they uh, collided with one another over time, producing a shower of smaller fragments. And today, of course, what we see is that there are many smaller objects, many more small objects uh, compared to the number of large bodies that are out there. So from that standpoint, uh, the video game is actually quite good. And so let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so I have here a video and I don't think I enabled the sound sharing on this, but uh, we can talk a little bit about it. Uh, actually, is there sound playing on that or no? If not, I will turn it down. Um, 
So uh, let's see here. Okay, so let's go ahead and play the video. We uh, don't this, sound. Yeah, th actually, that's just as well. It's it's kind of loud. Uh, you know what's going to happen? There's going to be a big explosion here. So, uh, but basically, the the key event here that this happened in 2013, and it was it was a really quite extraordinary event for asteroid science because. Uh, on this very day, there was actually supposed to be an asteroid passing uh, harmlessly by the Earth, but very, very close underneath the ring of geostationary satellites. And I was driving home from the airport when I heard a report on the BBC that an asteroid had impact, impacted over Russia. And I thought, well, that's impossible because the asteroid had a zero, just absolutely no chance of hitting the Earth. Well, as it turned out, this was a completely separate asteroid that just by a very large cosmic coincidence uh, actually impacted the Earth, and it was not the same asteroid as the one that we knew about. How do we know that this is a completely different object and not, say, for example, something that fragmented? Well, uh, these two objects came from completely different trajectories on the sky. So uh, there's no chance that they, they could have once been one object. But in any event, it was a huge surprise to everybody because uh, this asteroid, as you can see, it, it just um, it wasn't predicted. And the reason for that is uh, it came from a direction at its close approach as, as it made its way into the Earth's atmosphere that from a direction that was nearly uh, coincident with the sun's location on the sky. And of course, our telescopes just can't look that close to the sun. So it was just in the wrong part of the sky and uh, we just weren't able to see it. Uh, so anyway, these guys um, do manage to get out the door there. But you know, the point is, is this was, this was quite a shocking event because there wasn't a, the capability to actually spot something like this object. Now, the thing is, uh, this particular asteroid, um, it did manage to injure quite a number of people, mostly because of flying glass. People went to the windows to look at the contrail and then the shockwave hit and that blew out the windows uh, throughout the city of Chelyabinsk. So the key thing though, is that this object was very, very tiny. It was only about 20 meters across. And that's another reason why it wasn't spotted in advance. It's just simply so small that it would, be, it would have to get very close for our current survey telescopes to be able to spot it. Nonetheless, with the enormous velocities that these things travel with respect to the Earth, it still pa uh, packs in, uh, quite a punch and was uh, still quite capable of, you know, of injuring a number of people, even for such a small one. Mm -hmm. So of course, uh, in my mind, this kind of begs the question, how often does this happen? Not so much on a geological timescale, but rather on a human timescale. And of course, what do we do about it or what is being done about it? Uh, so I like to cover terminology here. I'm um, sure many of you guys are familiar with this, but just, you know, some basic terminology. Uh, asteroid, meteor, meteorite is just, it's all the same thing. It's just, of course, what has happened to the object? Has it actually made its way from deep space through the Earth's atmosphere and then ultimately to the ground? Uh, that's what determines what, how we refer to it. But in the end, it's all the same thing. And of course, you know, the, the, the question of how these bodies arose to be in our solar system traces back to the origins of our solar system, to the protostellar nebula out of which our, our solar system was first born. Uh, basically, the sun and the planets collapsed under the influence of gravity and angular momentum, condensing out to form the larger bodies, the sun and planets. But there are always leftover fragments that don't get swept up uh, into these larger bodies. And it's these smaller fragments that remain today and we know them today, of course, as the asteroids and comets. Most of the, the cometary bodies in our solar system originated at some point in the distant past uh, in the outer parts of the solar system where it's colder, and, um, and, uh, but the rockier bodies uh, condensed closer in. And that's, of course, a great simplification, but you, you get the idea. So if we look at the present day structure of the small bodies in our solar system, we can see that there's a huge number of them that are in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Uh, and of course, they're perfectly harmless when they're out there from a hazard perspective because they, they simply don't get anywhere close to the Earth. But there is a population here in the inter part of the solar system that does get close. And of course, this is what we define as the near Earth objects. So these are asteroids and comets that approach within about 1.3 astronomical units or 1.3 times the uh, distance of the Earth from the sun. And that's, uh, the, that's the population of interest. You can also see there's a couple of other interesting structures here. You can see these blobs of, of asteroids that are sort of locked into a, a resonance with the planet Jupiter. Uh, and these are called the Jovian Trojans. So they actually are gravitationally bound to Jupiter. And you can see some of the higher order resonances here, uh, these triangular blobs. So in any event, uh, this is what's going on today. We know of roughly 25, 26,000 near Earth objects at present 
Uh, and of course, there's nearly a million main belt asteroids that have been discovered to date. But just like the asteroids video game, we think that this represents a, a, just the tip of the iceberg for what's actually out there. Uh, so I always like to cover this just because it's kind of fun. But you know, if you were actually in our asteroid belt, what would you see? Would it look like The Empire Strikes Back? Uh, because that's another favorite movie of mine. No, in general, it would not look like this. Sadly, if you were standing on an asteroid somehow uh, safely in the asteroid belt, you would mostly see dots, unresolved point sources. Uh, because in general, the asteroids are, are very far apart. Space is very big. And in spite of how crowded that movie looked with all of the dots shown there, all the things that we know about, uh, nonetheless, space is just really vast, even compared to the sizes of the asteroids and how many there are. Okay, so just to put into context their sizes, uh, we have these wonderful movies now of two of the largest bodies in our asteroid belt, Ceres and Vesta, uh, relative to our moon. And you can see that Ceres, uh, of course, has two definitions. It's, uh, it's, it's an asteroid, but it's also known as a dwarf planet. And that's partially because of its very round spherical shape. Ceres is large enough to have reformed itself into a sphere under the influence of its own gravity. Uh, and then Vesta over here. These were both the targets of NASA's Dawn mission, uh, which returned some really spectacular data on the nature of these, these larger bodies in our asteroid belt. And then of course, here is uh, what I call the, the asteroid zoo. Uh, these are the pictures of the objects for which we have close up in person, uh, in situ measurements of. And that, there's a couple more that are, are not on this page here, but you get the idea ranging in size all the way from Vesta, which is one of the largest ones that we know about in the main belt, all the way down to uh, this one right here, which just looks like a tiny, tiny dot on the screen. Uh, but this is uh, asteroid Itakawa, and uh, this uh, was the target of uh, Japan's Hayabusa mission. Uh, so you range in size all the way from you know, hundreds of kilometers down to, down to just a kilometer or less. But nonetheless, uh, Chelyabinsk at 20 meters wouldn't even appear as a pixel on this, on this particular uh, parade of, of asteroids. Uh, but you can see also too, they have a, a wide range of sizes or shapes in addition to the, the immense variation in size. And of course, uh, I like to just show in context just how tiny a shooting star is. You know, grains of sand are enough to produce uh, a really bright flash in the sky just because of the, the sheer velocity with which they travel relative to the earth. It's, it's really quite spectacular. So let's talk a little bit about when we say near Earth objects, I'm, I'm actually talking about both asteroids and comets. Uh, both of these objects or both of these types of bodies can get within 1.3 AU of the sun. Uh, so they can both be classified as near Earth objects. And I think the, um, the key thing here is that the asteroidal bodies are more, um, they tend to be more solid and, and more rocky. Uh, so they range in, in, in enormous diversity from things that are almost solid slabs of nickel iron to things that are really essentially gravel piles, uh, just very weakly held together that have been shattered over many, many collisions uh, over the years. On the other hand, we have comets, which are much more weak bodies that are typically uh, a matrix of, of rocky material and dust that's all held together with various sorts of ices. Now, we now know that there's sort of, these are two ends of a spectrum, if you will, because sometimes we see asteroids that suddenly exhibit tails like a comet, despite the fact that they have very circular orbits that keep them entirely within the main asteroid belt. And on the other end of the spectrum, we sometimes see asteroids that have very cometary-like orbits, but show no sign whatsoever of any kind of activity. So uh, these two things are probably kind of ends of a scale, if you will, uh, with everything in between. But we care about both from a hazard point of view, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, uh, let's see. So moving along, we see plenty of evidence of impacts on Earth ranging from the more recent, uh, like Tunguska in 1908, to uh, things that occurred probably millions of years ago, if not um, you know, tens of millions of years ago. And of course, the, the big famous one, the, the one that really had a major impact on life on Earth, the Chicxulub impactor, which really was quite enormous and uh, had a profound impact on the evolution of life. You can see here, this is a, a, a kind of a map of, the, if you will, or a timeline of the diversity of species. This is actually genera, so one level up from species, pointing out some of the big extinction events that have occurred. And of course, here is the big one that happened uh, when the Chicxulub impact um, occurred. And you can see that it, it really did profoundly set life on Earth back uh, for several million years. Uh, millions of years. So uh, I would submit that we're kind of doing the experiment with sudden 
climate change right now, but this is an experiment that has already been done in many ways. And the answer is uh, not great. Life can recover, but it takes millions of years to do so. Uh, so that's way longer than any human time scale that we would want to wait. Okay, so back to the object that exploded over Russia, uh, like I said, 17 to 20 meters across. This is a picture of the largest fragment that was recovered. The US atmosphere did a very effective job of, of screening out the object and preventing it from causing more damage. But again, that's because it was so small. And here's a little picture of, of a piece that uh, shows the inside. It's just riddled with these, these um, cracks, uh, which I believe are signatures of previous impacts that the asteroid or collisions that the asteroid underwent. Uh, on its journey to the Earth long ago. So in any event, uh, when it comes to near-Earth asteroids and searching with uh, a systematic process for them, um, that's a relatively recent endeavor. And I would say a lot of changes happened in the last 20 to 30 years, uh, partly because of the advent of modern electronics, uh, the detectors that we now have uh, that allow these searches to be done in an automated fashion uh, compared to using film. Uh, that made a big difference. And then also events like this one, Shoemaker-Levy 9, when a comet was discovered just prior to impact with the planet Jupiter. Uh, there was a lot of debate about what would happen to Jupiter. And these spectacular Hubble Space Telescope in images show that indeed, um, even these fragments of the comet left you know, pretty significant and Earth-sized uh, scars on the planet Jupiter. So all of this put together uh, has spurred interest, I think, in, in understanding just how often impacts really occur. We can get a sense on a geological time scale by looking at the cratering record on the Earth and on the Moon. Uh, we can also do statistics by looking at the asteroid population and, and trying to infer how many times they're likely to get close. Uh, but when you talk about what specifically is going to happen in the next 100 years, in other words, time scales of interest to human beings living on planet Earth, that's a much more difficult question. And from my perspective, the only way to really answer it definitively is you need to go out and do some fairly systematic and thorough searches uh, for the asteroids and comets and, and just really see what's out there and measure their orbits. Uh, so basically that is, uh, from my perspective, one of the main things we need to know is when is the next big impact likely to occur? And then the question is how bad will it be? Uh, and that boils down to just about how much impact energy such an object would be capable of delivering. If we go through the mass, uh, the impact energy is the energy of motion, and that scales just as the mass times the velocity squared. Well, once we've found the object and we've calculated an orbit for it, we can predict the velocity um, with which it would encounter the Earth. So we can nail that down just from discovering it and getting a good orbit. But if we want to say something more about the impact energy, we really need to measure the sizes of the objects because the impact energy scales as the size or the radius to the third power. So small changes in size can make a very big difference in the impact energy. So we'd like to find the objects, get velocities and uh, impact times, if there are any, and then figure out the sizes reasonably well. Uh, so it's, a, it's kind of a funnel here uh, in terms of the knowledge. We, we know uh, less about the majority of objects than we do about a smaller number. So for orbits, we know, like I said, of about roughly 25,000 NEOs today. Of those, a few thousand or so have really well-determined sizes. When we get down to rotational states, there are fewer that are, are known. And if you want to know higher order parameters like precise shapes, densities, compositions, uh, taxonomy, whether or not they have satellites, that's a smaller number still. So the more we want to know about a particular object, uh, the harder it is to get that knowledge. Uh, so a little bit about NASA's program to, to systematically find, track, and characterize these objects. Uh, there's some really good news here, which is that, first of all, there is a program that is responsible for doing this. Um, now there are databases, there is a central database where astronomers can send all of our observations. And in this database, um, you, they, they basically put together all the observations to try to assemble up-to-date orbits for all the objects in, in basically real time. And then of course, um, my colleagues over at JPL are able to make predictions about whether or not any close approaches are, are likely to be happening. So all of this great stuff is, is you know, really relatively recent in the last you know, couple of decades. And I think that represents a big advance to at least have uh, systems in place where we can send observations that are keeping track of what's out there and where is it going. Uh, so this is just a kind of a high level snapshot of some of the, some of the uh, surveys that are going on today uh, that are aspects of NASA's near earth observation program. Uh, of course, our workhorse survey is this one right here, the Catalina Sky Survey. 
uh, which I'm sure you have heard about because it's, uh, it's really the most productive NEO survey right now. About half of all of the near-Earth objects that we know of today were discovered by Catalina, which is right here in Arizona. Of course, also the PanSTARRS telescopes are uh, very powerful tools as well, and they are in Hawaii. Uh, we also have the Linear uh, Space Surveillance Telescope uh, that's contributing, and a couple of other survey telescopes as well. Uh, and then this is the project I've been working on, uh, NEOWISE, which is uh, in space orbiting the Earth looking for asteroids and comets using infrared wavelengths. It's mostly dedicated to characterizing the objects these days, but occasionally we do make some discoveries to the, uh, at present. Uh, there is a huge and very active community of what I would call non-professional astronomers who are extremely important to the study of near-Earth asteroids uh, and comets. And they are all over the world. Um, one of the really fun aspects of working on asteroids actually is that uh, you get to make a lot of friends from all over the place because asteroids just go everywhere. Uh, when we're chasing something across the night sky, you never know when you're gonna need to call a friend in Chile or in Britain or in Illinois or wherever, uh, somebody who's got a telescope and is able to hop on an object to help us from losing it. So that's, uh, that's one of the really fun aspects about this particular work. And there are some really, really excellent non-professional astronomers who contribute greatly to keeping track of these objects and also measuring basic properties such as uh, rotational light curves. Uh, so uh, how many do we know about today? Like I said, about 25,000, but it's uh, not all equally distributed. So the red curve here shows the discovery progress for the very largest near-Earth asteroids. So these are objects that are thought to be larger than a kilometer across. These are the dinosaur killer class objects. You can see that this line is, is flattening out here. And uh, we think that is because we really have discovered nearly all of these objects, not every single one of them by any means, but more than 90%. Uh, we think we're running out of things to discover that are that big in the new Earth asteroid population. When it comes to medium-sized objects though, the numbers are still going up. And when it comes to all objects at all size scales, the numbers just go up, 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 indicating that we are nowhere close to having found all of them. Uh, so nowadays, if we look at the breakdown uh, by size, of what's being discovered, you can see that the majority of asteroids, of near-Earth asteroids that are being discovered are in this kind of small to medium category here. And there's a reason for that. Our telescopes that we have today only see a certain volume of space because of their sensitivity. These are relatively modest apertures. They're about one to two meters across. Um, so they're not you know, huge telescopes that we're talking about. The sensitivity limit means that something has to cross inside our little bubble that we can see before we can detect it. And because there are a lot more small asteroids out there, these are the ones that tend to be crossing into the sphere of visibility. And so nowadays, uh, without more capability, it will be impossible for us to really find large, a largely complete population of the big stuff. We need more sensitive telescopes is a way, another way of saying this. So if we break it down uh, by the percent of asteroids, and I should have put on the slide here, sorry about this, that are larger than the 140 meters, um, we know that most of these have not been found. Now, what is this George E. Brown survey goal? Well, this was actually a law passed by Congress that says that NASA needs to find more than 90% of all near-Earth objects that are larger than 140 meters in diameter. That was supposed to have been done by the year 2020, and that didn't happen, as you can see from the plot here. Now, why 140 meters? That seems like a weirdly specific number. Uh, the reason for that number is that if you do an actuarial study of just how much damage can something cause as a function of size, and then you figure out how many there are, a 140 meter object is capable of causing quite a lot of regional damage. Um, so basically any, anything larger than that is going to be an extremely significant event to the world. And the thought is that by working from these, discovering these larger objects down to the smaller sizes to a floor of about 140 meters, we will have significantly reduced the risk of an impact happening that could be very, very damaging that we don't know about. So that's kind of where this comes from. Bottom line, we need to do a lot more. A lot of good stuff has been done, but there's more work to do. Uh, so uh, I'll talk a little bit briefly about my project, which uses infrared light to study the asteroids. And this is basically, in essence, looking at the heat they emit. And the reason that's interesting is a couple of reasons. One, uh, the heat emitted by asteroids doesn't depend so heavily on the reflectivity of their surfaces as do the visible light wavelengths or uh, visible reflectivity. So in other words, uh, we can see things that are very dark um, because we're sensing the heat instead of the reflected sunlight. 
Uh, we can also use that heat emission to figure out the sizes relatively precisely, even though uh, we're not flying to the asteroid or anything like that. We can actually get a pretty good estimate of the size, and that's important because that helps us get a good handle on the potential impact energy. Uh, and of course, if these asteroids are very dark, um, it's just harder to see them with a visible light telescope because they're fainter. So um, this is kind of a, a fun example of what the sky looks like in infrared wavelengths. And you can see that in this color coding, the stars are very blue. That's because a typical star is thousands of degrees. So it emits really, really brightly at the shortest infrared wavelengths here. Um, and the asteroid is a much cooler object. Uh, this is a bunch of, a collection of exposures of a particular asteroid. This is the one uh, named after Martin Luther King. And you can see that its orange color indicates that it's actually a much cooler asteroid than, or a cooler object than the stars. So it shows up, it really sticks out like a sore thumb. And you can see there's, there's not a lot of other stuff that really looks like that in this image. So in other words, uh, asteroids are bright in the infrared, um, regardless of what their surface reflectivity is like. And of course, like I was saying, you can tell temperature, um, whereas with visible light, you, you just can't tell what's in the coffee mugs. But if you have a heat sensitive uh, instrument, you can clearly see which one has the, the hot coffee. And you can see my nose is cold right there. So temperature, uh, which in turn can be related to the diameter of the asteroid. Uh, so in any event, uh, this is just kind of another illustration. If you have measurements uh, from an infrared sensor, you can more easily break the degeneracy between something that's large, but really, really dark. So in other words, would appear faint at visible wavelengths and something that's much smaller, but has a, a much more reflective lighter colored surface. And if we were to look at it this way, take two asteroids of equal size, one lighter colored and one darker. Uh, if you are looking at them in their reflected light wavelength, visible light uh, wavelengths, which sense reflected sunlight, the lighter colored asteroid is brighter, but to the infrared telescope, they both look about the same. So uh, that's kind of one of the reasons. Now the existing telescope we're using is called WISE, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. And this was launched in late 2009 and it had four infrared channels originally. Um, it was not originally designed for looking for asteroids and comets. It was actually designed to look for other astrophysical objects. As it turned out though, uh, it was really quite effective at detecting asteroids and getting their sizes. Now, most of what we saw are asteroids in the main belt. Um, not near Earth objects. But we did learn quite a bit about the asteroid populations from looking at these data, and that's helped us a lot. So this is just some fun, you know, baby pictures of the spacecraft getting craned up onto the tower and all that good stuff, and the launch. And the real reason for doing WISE originally was just that our best view of the average part of the sky at these infrared wavelengths really was pretty um, just kind of limited based on the technology at the time. This is, this is what a typical patch of sky looked like before WISE. Uh, we had the IRAS and the Derby uh, instruments and they definitely did a wonderful job, but uh, they were limited to the detectors that they had. So with the modern detectors that WISE was able to produce, um, even though the telescope is uh, actually a little smaller than IRAS, uh, it just produced a great deal more resolution. Question from Tom. I see Tom's got his hand up. Can we take a question from Tom? I did that by mistake. Oh, no worries. <laughs> no problem. I'm trying to figure out how to turn off the, the caption. And I, I can't find it in the menus. So that is a good question. I'll just listen. OK, <laughs> no worries. Uh, so let's see here. So. Yeah, basically, one of the outputs of the project was to see uh, quite a number of asteroids, most of which in the main belt. And we were able to calculate sizes and reflectivities for everything, all of the asteroids that you see here. In total, we saw around 700 or so near Earth objects um, by the end of the, the first part of the mission. Uh, and that was able to tell us that from that data, we were able to say something about the ratio of bright to dark near Earth asteroids that were out there as a function of their size. So, what we found is that in short, um, there's, the ratio of bright to dark asteroids in the near Earth asteroid population remains roughly the same over a pretty broad range of sizes from large all the way to, to hundreds of meters across. What that means is that we think that there's a population of asteroids that are out there in the near Earth object population that are both smaller on the smaller, size, uh, smaller side and they're pretty dark. So we think that they are there. Previous surveys that did this measurement using just a visible light sensor alone 
showed that there were no small dark asteroids, but we think that's not actually the case. We think they're there, it's just they're faint and they're harder to see for a visible light telescope. So in any event, uh, we were able to set some constraints on the numbers of objects that we think are out there. And this was kind of a fun little discovery. If you recall the Jovian Trojans, the uh, two blue clouds of asteroids that were gravitationally trapped by Jupiter, uh, we found that the Earth has a Trojan asteroid of its very own, which is kind of fun. Uh, we have this object here called 2010 TK7 that is actually being kind of trapped by the Earth's gravity and it shares Earth's path around the sun. So it's a, it's a Trojan asteroid uh, of our very own. And so um, there's always some fun to be had when you are looking in an all sky survey. Uh, I kind of made this image just because it just sort of illustrates a few things. You can see all kinds of things. Um, a lot of nebulosity, of course, in, as we look deeper into the plane of the galaxy, but also we can see more distant things like uh, star clusters and, and uh, star forming regions. And then of course, some much more distant objects uh, that are way out in the plane of the galaxy. But uh, my favorite thing, lots and lots and lots of asteroids. And you can see zillions of little tracks in here. I think at one point I counted in this image, there are actually about a hundred running through here. So in any event, the sky is a very busy place. We do see all kinds of things with uh, our, our telescope with, with WISE that is, um, these ones right here, we're orbiting the earth and we're looking up. So what we're seeing, uh, these streaks are actually other satellites passing by overhead. They're not raindrops. Um, and of course, uh, we were really fortunate to be able to find Comet Neowise uh, last summer. And that was, that was just really a, a great trip to see something. Uh, with my own eyes that we typically just see as a, a few points of light on our computer screens. So that was pretty, pretty fun. In any event, um, this is one of my favorites. Uh, but all good things will come to an end. And NeoWise, like I said, was never really originally designed for searching for asteroids and comets, particularly near Earth asteroids. Uh, and its, its orbit is, uh, is starting to decay. Uh, it is well past its design life, which was uh, six months plus a one, one month in orbit checkout period. So as I like to say, we're, we're more than 10 years now into our six month mission. Um, and eventually the telescope is going to deorbit uh, naturally and, and burn up in Earth's atmosphere. So we've been really lucky to get this much time out of it. Um, but as you can see from our plots, there's a lot more we can do. And there's some good reasons to go and look for more things more comprehensively. Uh, if we look at what it would take to actually move an asteroid or comet out of the way, that's something that really does require years and ideally decades if you wanna have a number of different options. So this is a plot that just shows as a function of time before impact uh, and the size of the object, you know, what the range of options really are. And, and really uh, it's a great idea to have years to decades before impact um, so that we actually could have our best chance of moving something out of the way. So what that means to me is we wanna design surveys that can find these asteroids when they're 10, 20, 30 years away from any potential close approach to the earth. Uh, so we've looked at lots of different ways to do this. We've looked at many different survey configurations. And the one we ended up settling on is, is this one right here, uh, which is an infrared telescope that's, that's fairly modest in diameter. It's about a 50 centimeter primary. It's not the biggest mirror that we could have come up with, but it's, uh, it's pretty capable of surveying a pretty big volume of space at any given time. Uh, so that is the mission that we've been working on now called the Near Earth Object Surveyor. And its objective is to basically be the kind of bigger, better NEO-wise uh, with a larger field of view, more modern detectors, even bigger focal planes, uh, longer lifetime, and no cryogens that would run out. Um, so the idea is to uh, just do a much more comprehensive survey of what's out there. Uh, we have finally made it into phase B, which in NASA speak is the uh, preliminary design phase. And this is what the telescope will look like. Big tall sunshade on one side so we can point pretty close to the sun and painted very, very dark here on the back surface so we can efficiently radiate heat. Uh, the mission is scheduled to launch currently in March of 2026. So we are hard at work now on it and it's, uh, it's really great to be getting this far. Uh, so just uh, really fast, a little bit about it. This would be a two channel imager with two bands in the infrared centered near the peak of where asteroids are brightest. Um, this lets us have an efficient thermometer as well as being very sensitive to the objects. And the idea is unlike NeoWise, which was constrained to look in this little bitty narrow cone right here, uh, near Earth object surveyor will be able to see a much wider swath of the sky at any given point of time. Uh, and also too, it won't be orbiting the earth. So rather than having to deal with satellites passing overhead, 
uh, we'll just be out a little bit of ways away from the Earth at the Earth-Sun L1 Lagrange point. Um, this allows us a, a few different advantages. Notably, it lets us keep cold without having to carry active refrigerants or a cryocooler. Uh, but yet it's not so far away that we can't downlink all the data really efficiently. So that's kind of the, the, the happy spot there. And the idea basically is once this thing goes up is it will hopefully quickly and very rapidly scan the skies. It's doing the same survey pattern over and over and over again. Uh, and should find a whole lot of near Earth asteroids really fast. Hopefully reaching that uh, congressionally mandated limit of 90% of 140 meter and larger objects in roughly sort of 10 to 12 years time frame. So uh, that is what we think it will do. And the bottom line, uh, in summary, you know, a lot of progress has been made in this field and the worldwide community of both professionals and, and non-paid professionals uh, have made a huge amount of progress in, uh, in just understanding how many objects are out there, uh, how do we best track and characterize them, get good orbits for them. Uh, NASA has, has funded most of the efforts uh, for, for the, or has funded the efforts that have discovered most of the near Earth objects that we know about today. Good news, we found really, I would say most of the, the things that are the dinosaur killer size and larger, um, but you know, there's only about 1% of the Chalybeth size that are known. And we have in short, a lot more work to do, but we've made a lot of progress to date. So thanks very much for your time and I appreciate the opportunity to come speak. Okay, um, I want to check and see if we have any questions. Do people have questions for um, Dr. Miser? Okay, we have um, seven um, has a question. I, um, you may be able to unmute seven and ask your question. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for the talk. So I've been following these things with my uh, PVS 14 through my 15 inch quite well, and it's doing very nice. Um, one of the issues I've noticed, though, is that the uh, visual magnitudes listed can be wildly off. Um, so is there something that I can use to better plan in the near IR up to a micron? Um, I've been using AstroDisk and a, a neo disk because that lets me search by visual magnitude and you know speed because I'm interested yeah. in watching them move. You bet. I mean, yeah, this is so. So speaking from my own our, my own project stuff, uh, we have always had a hard time getting good estimated visible magnitudes because when we first spot the objects, we're spotting them in infrared wavelengths, which can have wildly different visible magnitudes depending on whether the asteroid is very very dark and has a low albedo or whether it's a more reflective one. Uh, so that's a known issue for us, and, and the magnitudes can be all over the map um, because we have to make a guess as to whether or not, based on our discovery images, the asteroid is is bright or dark. Um, so ours are they are going to be all over, uh, and that is another known problem. Also, just in general, even for the ones that are are purely observed by visible light telescopes, that it is pretty tricky to get good, reliable, predicted magnitudes for a lot of near Earth asteroids because we have to make a lot of assumptions about how the light scatters off the surfaces. Typically when they're discovered, we just don't have a lot of observations of them at a, and we see them only at a limited observing geometry. So the phase function, the reflective nature of the light isn't all that well characterized for a lot of near Earth asteroids. That is a known problem, unfortunately. And it's kind of a, it's kind of, a, it, it's one of the things that makes observing them so tricky. Um, so I would say, yeah, you are right caveat and tor, they can be off by a couple magnitudes in some cases. And there's not a lot of great solutions to be had there. You are not wrong. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Okay, do we have um, any other questions? I see one from Richard. Richard has his hand up. Okay. Thank you. So, I can't seem to type in the comments or in the comment section. How do you figure out how many asteroids you haven't found? That is the question. Um, so there's a couple techniques that we have that we can look at. One is uh, rediscovery. So in other words, if you kind of imagine we're taking M&Ms out of a bowl, and if we say, okay, we picked this M&M out, so let's put an X on it. Actually, instead of an X, let's put a number on it and then throw it back in the bowl. And then we reach in and we draw another M&M out of the bowl. 
Well, if we keep doing this, eventually we're going to only start drawing M&Ms where we have a number for it and we've already picked it out of the bowl. And the number of times that you find an M&M that doesn't already have a marker on it and a number starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's one indication that we may have exhausted nearly all the M&Ms that are in the bowl. But it's also possible, now you can imagine some kind of weird scenario where, okay, let's say we can only pick out M&Ms that are not green. For whatever reason, the claw that we're using to pick up the M&Ms just can't pick up green M&Ms. So you might mistakenly infer that you found nearly all of them when in fact, what's really going on is that your tool can't pick out the green M&Ms for some reason. So the, uh, the other approach for solving this question is to say you build essentially a model solar system. So you build a model of a bunch of asteroids with their orbits and their sizes and their brightnesses and all of this. And then you also build a model of your telescope. So in the case of WISE, uh, we know its sensitivity. So in other words, we know how faint of a, a star or a point source it can typically see. And we also know every single place that it's pointed on the sky. I have a complete list of all the pointings going back you know, for the entire mission. So what you can do is you can basically build a synthetic survey. You take your synthetic solar system model and you essentially kind of play it through your simulated survey. And then you tune the input population so that your synthetic surveys output matches what you see. And using that technique, you can say, okay, all right, I think if we've assumed that, we've that there are this many objects that we've seen this many, and we make everything, you, know, you basically tune the input population until it matches. Uh, so that's another alternative approach to getting at this. And, and we use both techniques. Um, and in this case, we really think that we really have exhausted most of the near earth asteroids that are larger than a kilometer. Not true for the comets. But that's another story. Okay. Thank you so much. Do we have other questions for Dr. Miser? Yes, uh, this is Dave Evans. I have a question. I just put it in chat. But do these darker colored objects that you're looking at in the infrared, does that suggest that they're more rocky um, or more dense and uh, wow. more dangerous? compared to maybe an icy reflective asteroid or object? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And so um, one of the things we, we think about these low albedo objects, the really dark ones, is that they are more likely to be extinct comets. Um, so in other words, we think that they're actually likely to be less dense um, and more weakly bound together. So these are really carbon rich objects. We think that ultimately originated in the outer parts of the solar system where they were in more water rich regions originally. Uh, at some point, we think the water was, was sort of vaporized off the surface. So you can imagine if a comet makes a lot of passes by the sun, after a while, those surface ices might have gotten evaporated away. There might still be some buried under the surface. And this, the object might be a really weakly bound, kind of think of almost like a, a dust bunny, sort of very weakly held together by all the, by all the frozen stuff or just you know, its own, barely held together by its own strength. So we think the ones that are the really low albedo objects are, are more likely to be these ex-comet remnants. Um, and that's based also on the meteorite falls that we observe on the ground. Um, so we do have a number of these carbonaceous chondrites and they tend to be much, much more weak than the, the rockier asteroids. That's not universally true, but um, kind of a general trend. So I guess if I had to pick an asteroid type to get hit by, I'd, I'd probably pick those types rather than the the um, more solid rocky bodies. Thank you. Okay, I think um, Alan had a question, which is, uh, can you comment on the asteroid Pallas? Oh yeah, uh, the Pallasites. Um, some of my all-time favorite meteorites, I have to admit. They just have some really, really beautiful uh, olivine crystals. It's absolutely fascinating. So Pallas, one of the larger bodies in the main belt, uh, I'm not a meteoriticist, can't, can't claim to be an expert on that, but that is a, a really interesting object because it's so uh, rich in olivine. And um, we think that that's a, um, the palisites are, are remnants of that. So can't say much more about it. I think it'd be a fascinating target to send a, a mission to someday so we could get a, a good up close look at it. Uh, but it's definitely distinct from the other, the other asteroids in the main belt. Yeah, do we have any other questions? Um, 
I'm seeing the hand from Richard and the hand from Seven, but I think we answered both of those questions. Oh, I have another one if you oh, want to yeah. take it. Yeah, hi. So the uh, the LRO has been seeing lots of asteroid impacts afterward and lots of satellite asteroid impacts with those main ones. Do the numbers comport with your uh, solar the solar system models which you have been developing? Yeah, so that is a really, really, I, I think the LRO experiments are just really amazing because you're seeing in real time things actually hitting the moon. Uh, and they're on a scale that's very small. So one of the difficulties we have with predicting the statistics is it's, it's not as hard to do at the larger sizes um, because it, we, we, the objects are quite bright, we can get good measurements of them. But when you get to the very small sizes, especially below that kind of 100 meter size limit among the NEOs, it gets to be a lot harder. The telescopes uh, just have a much harder time measuring any large fraction of the population so the LRO measurements kind of fill a crucial niche in the in the sort of meter to you know 10 ish 10 or 20 meter or so size range. Um, so that's really helpful in terms of just constraining the population of what's out there. Believe it or not, it's it's just not easy to do that from general telescopic observations because the optics are just so faint uh, by the time we see them. So that provides another valuable check on the statistics to help anchor what we think the size frequency distribution is doing. And then um, it's just also really fascinating to see these impacts happening in you know, near real time, essentially, the present day. Um, like you say, we see evidence of multiples, you know, in other words, things that have satellites. Uh, we think based on radar observations, where we can actually do radar imaging of the asteroids, that it roughly sort of about one in five or one in six have some kind of a satellite. And in fact, uh, in a few rare cases, um, near-Earth asteroids have been shown to have triples. So they actually can have, to, um, you know, multiple satellites. So that's pretty neat. So yeah, I think I think the LRO observations are helping us a lot to understand just how many are there at that kind of smaller end of the size scale. Does that kind of answer your question, Seven? Yes, of course. It's a uh, Seven, by the way. Um, I do have another question. With the uh, missing Arecibo now, is anything going to fill the gap with uh, ranging? Yeah, so um, so that yes, that was a uh, it's just a horrible, horrible loss on so many levels. It's really uh, quite gutting, actually. Um, and in terms of what we have now, the existing radar capability for doing near Earth asteroid studies is the Goldstone radar with the Deep Space Network. And so the the Goldstone radar. Um, those dishes uh, have a somewhat different capability than Arecibo. Arecibo is a much larger dish, um, but more restricted in where it could point because of the being built into the natural hillside. Goldstone is somewhat different in the sense that it's a smaller dish, um, it's, a, it's still very sensitive, and it can point over a, a much wider range of the sky uh, because it's a, it's a dish that's also meant for doing tracking of spacecraft. So in any event, uh, we still have some capability for, for doing radar imaging. And it's, it's quite powerful. Goldstone is a, is a really excellent tool. Um, but yeah, no, it's, a, it's a big loss. And just um, it's the end of an era um, to see Arecibo go like that. It's like I said, devastating. Not, not great news there, in short. Okay, do we have any other questions from members? I don't see any, but my my computer is not displaying like it usually does tonight. So we're kind of having some technology issues along tonight that we don't usually have. But hopefully I've got everybody except we um, we have a comment regarding Facebook. We don't have any questions from Facebook, but we wanted you to know that we've got visitors on Facebook from uh, Colorado, from the UK and from Australia. So um, we had an interesting collection of people uh, and from other places too, but those were the main ones that wanted to mention where they were from. That is great. So. Wow. Well, I really appreciate everybody taking the time to tune in. Okay. Yes. And thank you very much for, for your presentation. We really enjoyed it, Dr. Miser, and, and are looking forward to the future with your projects. Thanks very much. No, it's really a pleasure to get to be here and I appreciate all the really, really fun questions. Thank you. And, and uh, Dr. Miser will be with us later for a breakout session and um, we will um, say goodbye to our Facebook people and, um, and then we'll 
um, after that, um, have some time for some of our members. But um, we appreciate the Facebook people coming tonight and joining us. And we hope that, you know, you come. We're here every first Friday of the month. And, um, and we hope that you will join us um, here for our presentation, but otherwise as well. Um, we do do star parties online and have a number posted online. And you're very welcome to um, look at our website. And you, of course, you're invited to join our club or to donate to our club if you would like to. So we hope to have a lot of continued contact with you. And thank you for coming tonight, Facebook. Um, I have, um, oh, and I forgot David Levy before I was going to do this before I say goodbye to Facebook and I forgot, but David, we will do your two minute poem right now. So, well, thank you very much, Faye. And tonight's poem is going to be from William Blake. And some of you may remember him in 1783. I believe he was a member of the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. I can't remember who was president at the time. The only problem when I'm trying to look up in your archives is that it says that TAAA was not founded until the 1950s. Um, so that would be a problem there. And also, I don't think there's any evidence that William Blake ever was in the United States. But anyway, we can imagine that. And the poem I'm going to quote to you tonight is his sonnet to the evening star. Now, fair haired angel of the evening, now whilst the sun rests on the mountains, light thy bright torch of love, thy radiant crown put on and smile upon our evening bed, smile on our loves, and while thou drawest the blue curtains of the sky, scatter thy silver dew on every flower that shuts its sweet eyes in timely sleep. Let thy west wings wind sleep on the sleep on the lake. Speak silence with thy glimmering eyes and watch the dusk with silver. Soon, full soon, dost thou withdraw. Then the wolf rages wide and the lion glares through the dim forest. The fleeces of our flocks are covered with thy sacred dew. Protect them with thy nymphalics. Thank you very much, and back to you, Matt. Right. Thank you so much, David. We really appreciate your doing that, your thoughtful words that you always share with us. Um, I have one uh, announcement, and that is that, and, and some of you, of course, are aware of this, but in the Astronomy Day magazine, the October issue, there um, is an article about TAAA and the Chiricahua Astronomy um, Complex, so that we hope that you will, you know, take a look at that and, and enjoy that article. Uh, Jim Knoll spent hours and hours on that article, and there was a whole group of people who um, provided editing for it. Jim was very patient with all of us. Um, making comments um, about the article, as, as some of you know, you know, when you do have a whole bunch of people editing, um, it takes some patience for the author to deal with that. And Jim was very gracious. And, um, and it, so anyway, we hope that you'll get a chance to take a look at, the, at that article. And now I am hoping that we're able to go into breakout rooms, which is what we plan to do. Um, as I mentioned, we have had some technology issues tonight, but um, Jim Noll was able to join us for a little bit, which may mean that the weather at Joshua Tree is not being ideal. Um, and, um, but also Terry Lappin um, got, dropped off at one point when our speaker was presenting. But but the last contact I had, Terry was back with us. So Terry, are you with us now? Yes. OK, so do you think that you can make the breakout rooms work? We lost your voice, but we, right. we got your, yeah. your sign. There you go. We had echoing in here because we were using the other computer. Okay, so um, yes, I'm back. 
I am back through the U of A, my U of A account. Um, I could not get back in through the TAAA account, but I'm amazed that the meeting actually didn't stop. I really thought it was going to just die. But anyway, um, we have two breakout rooms. Uh, you will be able to assign your own room if you do not uh, have the, if, if it doesn't pop up on your screen, you can put in the chat which uh, room you want to be in. Um, the two and then there'll be the general room in addition to that? Yes. If you don't pick a room, you will stay in the main room where we'll have just an open discussion. The two rooms are the speaker's room and the astro imaging room. Um, they will run for 30 minutes. You will get a countdown. I will try to send you a message on your screen at 15 minutes and another one when you've got about five minutes. Um, if you do not pick a room on your screen and you want me to assign it, please put it in the chat. Okay, I'm about to open the rooms. And Terry, don't forget to uh, enable sharing, screen sharing. Oops, oops, oops. Thank you so much, Jim. Okay. Hey, Terry, it's Amy. You can uh, feel, I, you're going to assign me the one, right? I'm looking at a blank screen. Should I pick the top one or the second one if I want to be in the speaker's room? Terry, did you hear the question? Terry's screen is still with us, so she's still there somewhere. Yeah, I'm not seeing any uh, text on my little dialogue boxes tonight. Is it the top one or the second one that is the speaker's room? Um, I am not having my usual picture on my screen tonight. And so I don't have that. I, I, I can't tell you, but let's see if Jim, no, are you still here? May, let me answer his question. Okay. Richard, do you want to be put into the speaker's room? Yes, the speaker's room. Okay, I will put you there. Bye. Thank you. Okay, so is there anybody else who needs to be put into a room? I would like to go into the astral imaging room. And you are Tom. There you go. Thank you. Bye. Okay, I think we've got about a dozen people in the uh, main room still. I'm going to jump into the other rooms and see how we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I have, I think, 13 people who are unassigned, which means that you're in the main room. Hopefully, that's where you intended to be if you're here. And if not, we'll get word to Terry. So, okay. I don't know why we've been having some issues on and off tonight, but I think it's wonderful that Jim and Terry have made it work throughout. So, we're conquering the issues, whatever they are. Brian. Good. So I don't think, Terry, anyone else needs to be switched. If anybody does right now, it's the time to say so. What was that? I said, I don't think there's anyone else who wants to be switched to a room. No. I'm just trying to make sure. No, I don't see anybody. OK. Okay, so how are people doing tonight? 
not very well right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know Terry's been having a lot of stress throughout this meeting. So, and she's been handling it really well. We applaud, applaud you, Terry, for um, keeping your act together through all this. Yeah, I don't know what happened, but all the windows just froze. And <clears throat> I, I noticed the, the closed captioning stopped updating. And then her window, instead of having a black background, went to a white background. I could still see her. I could see her slides, but none of the other windows were active. So I, I right. luckily Jim took over hosting, and then I came back in through my U of A account, and I can run things now. So yeah, my screen has has been set up differently tonight than it ever has been before, and I updated the software. Yes yesterday i think it was anyway so well there certainly could be variables with that um as a matter of fact i updated my software yesterday or day before too so this may this might be some new quirk in zoom that will go away with the next software change which will probably be this week this, <laughs> Zoom tends to change their software very frequently. So Doug was kind of iffy tonight with his hands. I think he was sort of waving his hands like, you know, things are so-so tonight. I haven't been out with my telescope because of the weather, so. Yeah. Yeah. 